Can you even hear me when I wear this? Maybe I should try giving it with this on. <laughs> I know last year people said they were disappointed I didn't wear it. I don't want to disappoint my fans this year. All right, so welcome to Fighting Hardware Attacks with Software. If you couldn't tell, I'm Dr. Unicorn. Even little kids walking along the street seem to know my name when I wear this outfit for some reason. But uh, today I'm going to be going over several different kinds of hardware-based attacks and then talking about how to defend them. And even though they're hardware attacks, I'm going to focus on how to defend them with software. You might wonder, how can you defend against someone blasting your CPU with a laser with software. The answer to that is that it's really hard, but there's a few tricks that kind of do it. But other kinds of attacks are a lot more malleable to software solutions. And you'll see that as we go on. And finally, uh, I'm begging that most of you in here probably aren't ever going to use any of this information I'm talking about, and you're just here because that's, you think this kind of stuff is awesome. Anyone here of that mindset? All right, so I I consider myself a side channel attack hobbyist, so I try to find ways you can do things on your own. So that's going to be what I'm going to go over a bit about how you can try some of these attacks for yourself. All right, so okay, so ordinarily when uh, we look at an encryption function from an attacker's perspective. We think of it as a function of one input of a key, maybe possibly, I mean, a plain text, maybe possibly two with a key. But in reality, when you're an attacker, you don't usually have that key. So we tuck it away in that black box and consider it to be just part of it. However, and when the, and the output of that function is a ciphertext. And as attackers, our goal is to find a way to be able to transform a ciphertext back into a plain text. And there's a way you can do that, but it involves solving a really hard puzzle that no one has ever figured out how to solve. And so that's, however, if we happen to have this little key, then it's really easy to solve it and problem solved just by that. So how do we get that key? Uh, it turns out that So it turns out that this is a, actually a really simplified view of a cryptographic function. There's actually more inputs and outputs here than you're seeing on this display. Is the mask? Yeah, it's <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. There's actually some unexpected inputs that we can look at as well. Oh well. So anyway, so this is actually what it really looks like in practice. You have a whole bunch of different uh, unexpected I'm using this mic now? Okay. All right, so there's a whole bunch of unexpected inputs and outputs that you don't really realize when you're just looking at your function in this traditional sense. For instance, you can uh, change the voltage when the CPU is running 
and that can interfere with its execution and causing it to do things like execute instructions incorrectly or skip them. And on the output side, you have like the power consumption that the process takes while it's running and its electric fields, magnetic fields, the time it takes to run, and even audio emissions and temperature changes and memory usage. And all of these unexpected outputs, if you're sophisticated enough, you can find ways to exploit them to reveal secrets like the key that we're after. And really, all these different things like the magnetic field and such are part of the environment that the processor is running in. So you can kind of go back and use those as unexpected inputs to the processor as well because they interact with it. All right. And so when you look at all of these different unexpected inputs and outputs and exploit them, we're able to make any encryption function look like nothing more than a white box obfuscation. And we can get the key out of it. So there's lots of different kinds of hardware attacks. I'm organizing them for my purposes as attacks that exploit our access to information that we expect to be there, but we don't expect someone else to have access to. Something like that would be sniffing a bus connection between your CPU and memory, for instance. And then there's also attacks that exploit unexpected inputs. Those are fault attacks. And example is like shooting a laser at a chip to cause the, some of the transistors to conduct when they normally wouldn't. You can ch do things like flip bits that way. And there's also attacks that target unexpected outputs. So those are side channel attacks and they get most of the attention for a good reason. And um, you can do cool things like uh, uh, recover keystrokes from across the room by just listening to the sound of someone typing. And one of my favorite attacks of all time, in a classic at that, is reconstructing images on a computer monitor from the radiation that it emits, or radio waves. And here's an example of that process. On the left, you see what is on a screen. And on the right, you see what they are able to pick up on the screen from across the room just by recording the electromagnetic radiation of the monitor as it ran. Okay. And if you want to test this effect out for yourself, there's a program called Tempest for Eliza that basically turns your computer monitor into a really crappy, low-grade AM radio station, but it's still fun to play with. And it's just some simple Linux program. Okay. So how, so how can you stop this particular attack of reconstructing a monitor? Uh, one example you might think of is to just shove the thing in a Faraday cage, or maybe you're a bit more sophisticated and have special glass that shields your monitor. The idea is just to block the, your emanations from escaping, so they're all contained in there. Another way is you might decide that you know that your wires can also conduct signals, and so you decide to shield them and filter them so that no one can just tap your power line and be able to get that signal there. Or you can even go step up and try a full out isolation. Uh, another approach might be to get a jammer and have it uh, try to broadcast the signal at the same frequencies as your monitors using to broadcast these unintentional broadcasts. And hopefully that will interfere with an attacker's ability to reconstruct your image. But unless your jammer signal is closely correlated with the signal that your monitor is actually emitting, then you can just average over it and reconstruct the image that way. So it's not always effective. Uh, a simple approach is just to make sure that if you see anyone with a weird looking antenna walking around that you ask them to leave. And, <laughs> and this is a clever thing. Uh, so when you're reconstructing an image of a monitor, you usually will average over several frames in order to get a good clear image. But ordinarily your monitor runs in this order from, from the top left to bottom right, like that. But if you randomize the lines that are displayed on the screen, then every time it runs, uh, they'll be averaging a different part of the screen if they just 
average over by looking at the time it takes to display an entire image on your screen. And that can defeat this attack. And you might just consider dumping your CRT monitor because you know it's old and crappy and uses a lot of voltage for that electron beam that gets a big leaky signal. But it turns out that your flat screen monitors also are vulnerable to this attack, just not quite as bad. So, so far, all of these attacks, I mean, countermeasures have one thing in common, and that's that they're hardware based. But this talk isn't about hardware countermeasures, it's about software. So, how on earth would you defend against something like this at a software level? And that is a question that I didn't even think to ask not too long ago. And it's kind of surprising what the answer is. And that's that we're, so this is an example of an image that your monitor might be displaying with two lines there. Whenever you have a white pixel, then you would, then that means that your electron beam would be active and shooting at your screen. And on the black pixels, it wouldn't be doing anything, so you wouldn't be using much power there. And you can see that it on the bottom they have a graph showing this effect. Turns out that the signal that the attacker is going to get when they try to pull off this attack is caused mostly by these sharp changes in voltage. So one approach that was tried was to uh, filter out high frequency changes that we'd, you would display to your screen. So it would look something like this. I only did the top line here, unfortunately, so it's kind of odd. But you can kind of tell that it is not quite as sharp now. And we look at this in real life and see how it works in practice against an attack. You get something like this, where the top lines are unfiltered and the bottom lines are more filtered. And you can see that this really works, at least when they tried it. So uh, that countermeasure is only uh, applicable to analog-based monitors, though. So for digital monitors, the compromising emanations emanate from the wire going from your video card to your monitor. And the signal that gets leaked depends really on exactly how the, your ones and zeros flow across the wire. So one approach that works with uh, countering these kinds of attacks on digital displays is to randomize the least significant bits of your, of your display. And that won't make a difference when you look at your image with your eyes, but it will really mess up your attackers when they try to reconstruct your image. So we also have this interesting effect where if you carefully analyze how the wires transmit and represent the color codes, you can create interesting contrasts that don't show up very good when you try to do this attack. So uh, peering at monitors is fun, but it's hardly the only hardware attack out there. A really common basic one is called simple power analysis. And this is where you hook up a, like a current meter to your device and watch as it executes instructions. And by looking at that power trace, you're able to tell what instructions got executed. So I'm going to show you an example of using a power a simple power analysis attack on RSA. So for RSA, uh, we'd usually be interested in acquiring this private decrypting key I have represented as D here. And you see on the decryption operation, we need to take C to the dth power, modulo N. Well, that brings up an interesting question, which is how do you calculate that? Because those are both big numbers. So uh, one approach is to use this uh, square and multiply algorithm. It's a pretty straightforward thing to do. You represent your exponent. In this case, we're going to be looking at our secret key as our exponent. And you represent it as a binary string. And going from the most significant digit down to the least, you would end up performing some operations on it to calculate it. And it turns out that the interesting part is that when the exponent bit that you're looking at is a 1, you're going to do a square operation and a multiply operation. But when that bit is zero, all you're going to do is square it. So there's now a dependence. So there's now a dependence upon your secret key on what instructions get executed. And if 
like I said, we can tell what instructions got executed just by looking at the power consumption, then we should be able to acquire the secret key by measuring the power. And so here is an example of that, my lovely artistic uh, interpretation of what this would look like on our real system. Uh, you can see that some of these are going to look a little skinnier than the others, and that's because they're only doing squaring operations, which must mean that that bit was a zero. And so by doing this, you can see how you can get the secret key just by looking at the power consumption. So to defend against this, a straightforward thing to do might be to just add a dummy operation when it's zero to always multiply. It won't affect the outcome value, but it, when you're doing this kind of attack, it, it will make it so that you can't easily distinguish between them. And I say easily because there's a whole bunch of different other attacks that can get past this countermeasure. Uh, one, one of them that you might want to look into a lot is called differential power analysis. And unlike simple power analysis, we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of different traces and averaging them together and doing some, uh, and taking their difference to find where, to find some interesting information. And the cool thing about this is it not only allows us to tell what instructions got executed, but what values those instructions were executing on. And so it can defeat things that just try to rely on a constant execution time. So to do a differential power analysis attack, we're going to get a whole bunch of different plain texts and have our uh, encryption algorithm. In this case, I'm going to use DES as an example. And we're just going to have it encrypt it while we record its power consumption and the resulting ciphertext. And then we're going to, for every one of those traces we got, we're going to try to predict a value, an intermediate value. In this case, it will be one of the bits of L in the very last round of DES. So that's where the red dot or the line is there. And to do that, we're going to have to guess. So in order to calculate that, we already have part of the equation, which is the green part which is fed into this f function here. But there's another part we would need to calculate. It turns out that the value of that bit is going to also depend on a round key, uh, about six bits of it, I think. And so we can just guess those six bits and calculate w what the resulting L would be from our known ciphertext result and what we guess the key to be. And so there's only six of them, so that's just two to the six guesses per each of these traces that we have to do, and that's manageable. So when we do that, we're going to, if we decide that L is going to be zero, then we're going to put that power trace in one pile, and if it's going to be, if we decide that L is going to be one, we'll put it in a different pile. And then we're going to average each of these piles together, um, and then we're going to take the difference of them. If we're right and L, if we're right about our guess of the key, then when we do this, we should see a big spike when we take the difference of them. But if we're not right, then we're not going to see a spike like you see at the top. So one way to try to get around this problem is a technique called masking. This is where I was going to originally pull up my mask because I am, like I say, a uh, on my Twitter account, uh, rubber mask connoisseur. This is kind of my thing. But uh, this, unfortunately, is not quite as awesome as that. It's an attempt to decorrelate the intermediate values of our function while it's running so that when you do so attack like DPA, all you're going to get is some value that is some basically random value that we can't do anything with. So it makes things like our, so it can, okay. So we have here a little d diagram of how this masking works. At the top is an ordinary function. At the bottom is where it's masked. In this case, m is going to be just some random number we pull out. And then we're going to XOR it with x. And then we'll feed that result into our, or our function. And do our processing with that, but when we're done with it and we're, and we're trying to get back to what the value should have been if we didn't use masking, we're going to need another function, in this case that's C, 
that we have to combine it with that in order to get our end result. So you have to, when you use masking, you have to mask your result and do all your actual work and then unmask it at the end. And that puts limitations on what kind of operations you can do in between without having to switch masking types, which there are several different kinds. Uh, so some other countermeasures you might try are making it harder to align power traces, because uh, I said that you had to collect a lot of different power traces in order for this attack to work. So if you make it so they don't line up, then when they average them together, they're not getting anything useful. So you can shuffle around the order of operations if it doesn't matter, like in multiplication. Nothing wrong with switching that to DBAC. But if you did that for every time you ran it, then when they average them together, they're not going to get anything useful. And you can also try adding in random dummy functions every now and then, or delays, to foil aligning them as well. So. And another strategy is more at the protocol level, where you're going to say that you're expecting someone to eventually be able to compromise your system to one of these attacks. So you're just going to change the key every now and then, hopefully before they're able to get enough traces to pull off an attack. And there's lots of different attacks in this fashion, like uh, electromagnetic analysis, which is where you would look at its electromagnetic radiation instead of its power consumption. But those two are closely related. Uh, but it has some advantages, like you can uh, focus in on a specific area of the chip to get a stronger signal for that to filter out some of the noise. And there are certain instructions that are more noisy electromagnetically than power-wise that you might be able to exploit. Uh, some other things are like higher order DPA, which is uses several different areas to counteract masking at once. And then there's things like template attacks and that correlation power analysis, which I won't get into. So uh, an interesting thing that happened like in December of 2013 is a cool paper where uh, these Israeli researchers were able to crack a GPG RSA key just by having a smartphone sitting next to the laptop as it was running its email program and decrypting emails in the background. And it did that within an hour. And the way that worked is the, your computer will emit noise based on its power consumption. So your power supply unit, will, when it's drawing power, will have to, uh, it changes the vibration of your capacitors and coils and that creates a sound that correlates with the, your secret keys. And you can extract them that way. And the patch that GPG released just a little bit after that uh, involved a form of masking called blinding. And you can see it right here. I'm not going to go into it, though. But, it's, but you can actually patch things like this in software. And this is just an example of how that looks. So timing attacks are kind of special because uh, for most of these, um, the question is, how on earth would you defend against this attack, which is obviously a hardware thing in software. But for timing attacks, it's a little bit different. We're asking, how would you defend a timing a attack with hardware when it's almost certainly more of a software thing? Um, they're special because unlike the other ones, we're not measuring a tangible thing like radiation or sound, we're measuring just time. And that also means that we can pull these off remotely pretty easily. So, all right, so here's an example in 2003 where they were able to extract OpenSSL keys from across a network. At the time, OpenSSL didn't use uh, timing attack mitigations by default because it was believed that it wasn't important. It was only important for things like smart cards that didn't have a whole bunch of stuff going on in the background and so they weren't very noisy. But these researchers were able to take advantage of some dependence on the secret key and the timing. Uh, there were two parts of RSA in particular that were vulnerable, and that was where they were doing these things called Montgomery reductions, where they had to do an extra one if the value is too big. And another thing where they use a different multiplication algorithm if A and B were the same size, as opposed to if they were different. And using these kinds of subtleties, they were able to extract the key. And a big part of that was there's a dependence on the number of 
on the probability that an extra reduction will have to be done depending on the value of your ciphertext that you're choosing to decrypt. So you can see here that if you chose your ciphertext carefully, you can get some information about what Q or P is, and those are parts of uh, what determine your secret keys. And you can get them from just knowing them. So some for OpenSSL, they patched that by just making blinding the default option. But some other options they could have explored were to force everything to take an equal amount of time. Uh, that's not something that people like to do very often because it ruins performance. It makes it so that every operation always takes the worst possible execution time. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Especially because we still don't use SSL everywhere because it takes more resources in part. <laughs> so hash attacks are kind of like timing attacks, but we're going to take a more active role in the sense. So let's say that, uh, so you, here you have your CPU and it always is accessing stuff in memory, but it can't wait a microsecond or whatever tiny amount of time it takes to transfer it from RAM to itself. So whenever it gets something from memory, it stores it in its cache. But the problem is the cache only has so much space. And so sometimes it will have to uh, evict some of the things it's cached in favor of something it more recently used or expects to need more. And so you can exploit this uh, to recover a secret key, like on a server. Let's say that you had uh, AES, something that was running AES in the background running on your server. It was a privileged user, and you were just a regular user, so you couldn't just dump its memory to find the key that way, but you still wanted it. So you can create a different progress, which we'll call your spy process, and it will just go there and try to pull a bunch of memory locations and hopefully fill up the cache. And then when your AES program tries to run, it, there's a part in its operation, which is like the SBOX operation, where it it's, looks up a memory location based upon a value that's derived from the secret key. And so in this case, it's looking that up right now, but your spy process already hogged all the cache, so it has to go into memory and pull that value from there sticks it back in the cache, and now when your spy program runs again, when it reaches that particular value that needs to access, that's in the same cache line, it, will, it won't find it anymore, and so it will have to pull it from memory, and it's going to be timing every access it does. And so when it reaches this particular value that your AES program ran, it's going to take a little bit longer. And that will tell it that some other program was interfering with its uh, execution and it will tell it an idea of what memory region that program was trying to access and if it depends on this in part on the secret key then that is an avenue where you might be able to use to determine what the key is so some ways to defend against these cache attacks are to just don't use memory addresses that are derived from secret values that's not always easier said than done because, because it, these, uh, like in AES, the table lookup is an optimization for a function. So it's just a pre-computed function. And you could always just try computing the function on the spot, but that would take longer. So we'd rather use the lookup table if we can. Um, and you can also store your uh, lookup table on somewhere where you won't ever have a problem with it running into your cache. But there's not that many places to do that, like your CPU registers, but they're often not large enough to store that. Uh, there's also another approach called bit slicing, which you kind of process each bit on its own thing, but I won't get into that. So there's also a closely related thing called branch predictions attacks. Uh, so these days, processors are high, heavily pipelined, and they don't like it when they have to reload everything because they mispredicted a branch. So they have a big unit that just tries to predict when a branch will be picked so it can continue loading instructions without interruptions. But that process can only store so many different addresses in it. So you can do a similar thing where you have your spy process trying to 
uh, fill up that branch target buffer. And when your other encryption program runs, it will it will cause the buffer to evict some of its uh, addresses. And then when your spy process runs again, you'll notice the timing difference there. And you can do that to break things like our balanced execution tactic, the square and multiply always we did for a simple power analysis of RSA. Because that, even though each branch would take the same amount of time, it would be different branches still. All right, so fault attacks are cool because you get to talk about lasers, even though that's just one example. But everybody loves lasers for some reason. So, uh, so some of the things you can do are to flip bits in memory with lasers, for instance, or, or on a wire. Uh, there's a recent thing that got in the news about accessing adjacent locations in physical memory. It repeatedly can cause it to leak over into the adjacent memory regions. You can flip bits in RAM just by repeatedly, repeatedly accessing memory. And they were able to turn that into an actual exploit or two. So, is it, so these kinds of fault attacks aren't just for doing sneaky crypto things. You can just hijack systems outright and pop a shell. So, but that's not to say that there aren't any fancy crypto attacks on there. There's a lot of, of attacks that rely on t measuring differences between an encryption that goes right and an encryption that you tampered with and being able to determine keys based on analyzing the differences of the results. So countermeasures for fault attacks aren't easy to do in software. They really are a hardware problem. But there are some things that you can do that might kind of help. Like you can use error correcting codes. And I didn't know this before, but apparently you can use error correcting codes not just to verify things are correct when you store them, but also when to make sure that an actual operation like addition or something performed correctly. I'm not sure how that works, though. But uh, we often often might just be easier to compute something twice and then check the results to make sure that it got the right answer both times. And if it didn't, then you would assume that there was a fault attack or something going on, and you can take action with about it. And a, a particular good way to do that with encryption is to encrypt something and then try decrypting it after and comparing if you get the original result still. So. You can also try attacking random number generators. There was a neat uh, attack where some people were modified the Intel Ivy Bridge random number generator by changing the dopant polarity of it, which is hard to detect. But it would, but their attack uh, eroded the entropy of the random number generator significantly, and it wasn't detected by standard randomness tests. And they also have to worry about other things like backdoored random number generator standards. <laughs> so if you want to try defending against your attacks on random number generators, you could just try testing them to make sure that the results actually are random. And you don't just have to do that at one sitting. You could continuously pull your number generator and, and try uh, seeing if it's still random continuously. But really, no tests can prove whether it's random or not at the end of the day. And you can also try uh, just combining different sources of entropy together just in case one of them fails. So that's what a lot of operating systems do these days because they don't trust hardware random number generators because of problems with them. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip that. Okay. All right, so there's some various other things where you could like sniff your bus or direct memory access attacks, those kinds of things. Um, one approach to defending against those kinds of attacks is to encrypt your memory. So oftentimes we talk about encrypting hard disks, but you can also try encrypting memory. Uh, that's what um, this tool called Hair tries to do. You might have heard about that a while ago. And also Trezor, something similar. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of cryptography software is very careful about cleaning up after itself, 
whenever it's done using the st stack. So we'll always do what's called stack burning and delete it so that it doesn't leave any lingering values behind for someone to snoop on later. And an interesting thing is that some memories have a property where if they keep the same value in them for a long time, the values can actually burn into them. So if you cut the power on it, you can still go in there and figure out what values they had. So you have to have something called like a memory saver, which that functions like a screen saver, but for memory, to make sure that it doesn't burn in. All right. Uh, and you can also do things besides uh, attacks, exactly. So this is a, a technique called clock skew fingerprinting, where say you have a bunch of computers that are all the same make and model behind some added firewall or whatever, and you wanted to try telling them apart. Well, if you send them a whole bunch of, if you, ask, if you keep asking them for the time, um, it's possible to determine which computer is which, because it turns out that every computer's uh, internal clock is going to be slightly unique. And if you take a whole bunch of time stop me measurements and determine exactly how much faster or slower their clock is compared to your clock, uh, you'll get unique results that you can use to determine that this would be the result of two different computers instead of just one. And you can use this technique or modified variants of it to like attack Tor hidden services, at least theoretically in the past. <laughs> so uh, to fight against this kind of attack, you could just try disabling timestamps that might cause certain network problems. But I mean, Windows does that and it doesn't seem to kill everything. Uh, you can add random noise to your timestamp, but that will just require your attacker to take more samples. And a in more interesting approach is the skew mask thing, which is a which was a project where they made a patch to the Lynx kernel, which I'm showing you in the entirety right here. Not very big. It just gets rid of the three least significant bits of the timestamp so that it can still be useful for things like pause or round trip time estimation while not being as useful for fingerprinting. So just going over some uh, hardware countermeasures that you can use. You can One approach is to just suppress any kind of leaking information. That's what my hiding category is here. So things like shielding or using filters or making sure you have an instruction set architecture that supports constant time instruction execution. And I always forget what that key is for some reason. Oh, special logic styles. Uh, a particular example is called bounce dual rel logic, where instead of just having one wire representing a value, you have two. And they'll be opposites, so that if it's a one, they'll be so if so that the power consumption will always remain the same, because it'll have to be a one and a zero, no matter whether it's supposed to represent a one or a zero. That make any sense? <laughs> uh, another approach is to just try adding noise to your system, so it's harder for people to measure it, so jamming and the like. But that just takes more tries before you can average away the noise, and then just stopping people from accessing your systems by using like tamper resistant processors or or making sure that no one can just waltz in and poke around your systems. Uh, for software countermeasures, uh, the approach is generally fall into ensuring that your programs run with a constant execution time. So that's where our branches code, for instance, went. Um, and for you can also try inducing noise on measurements in software uh, by like, shuffling the operations or even doing random delays or dummy operations. And also included that would be randomizing outputs, like randomizing your timestamp counter every time you start a new TCP connection. Um, and a really good attack, I mean, a really good tactic is to limit your key exposure. So make sure you change your key before someone is able to break into it and get it through one of these attacks. You can also work on uh, accepting that you're going to leak lots of information, but just realize that there might be ways that you can make the information that you leak not correlated with anything useful. That's what the masking is all about, and when it comes down to it, encryption and obfuscation are like that as well. 
And for follow attacks, again, we just needed to detect errors. Not necessarily easy to do this in software. And the best advice, though, of all is not to keep a secret in the first place. But that's not always applicable. But sometimes we forget about that and just store everything. They'll haunt us later. So, so this talk has a lot about cryptography in it. And cryptop cryptographers are mathematicians at heart, so they always like to do proofs and stuff. And you might notice that I've just been talking about attacks and then specific countermeasures to combat them. So this is like just finding an exploit and patching it. We're not actually doing any real security engineering here, possibly. So is there some sort of formal way that we can show that our systems won't be vulnerable to attacks, even ones that we don't know about yet? And there's definitely people working on that problem, several different theories and things you can look at if you're interested in that, but I won't talk about them here. Uh, but some interesting results of that are tools, they're research grade, as far as I know there aren't any real commercial ones, but that tried to automatically apply certain countermeasures here to your code on areas that you'd mark as sensitive. And you don't necessarily want to always implement these countermeasures and because there's always trade-offs to be made. It's going to cost more money eventually. Your code's going to be more complicated, so when someone tries to debug it or fix it when there's an error, they're not going to have any idea what you're doing. And it'll take it more time to run. And another thing that's often overlooked is that a lot of these countermeasures, like masking, require you to use lots of extra random numbers, which aren't always in high supply. So, uh, and a particularly bad thing is that sometimes adding one of these countermeasures can inadvertently make it easier to do enough, a different attack. So we need to just keep in mind that an encryption algorithm needs to be just as efficient to run as it is inefficient to crack, although maybe not quite that severe. So a lot of times you might get the impression that these are just theoretical things that don't really matter to the real world all the time. But uh, intelligence agencies have been exploiting these side channel attacks since the days of cipher machines. They might not actually do a whole lot of use in them in practice, but they have capabilities to do it. Uh, I just read a while ago that like the CIA and stuff was trying to do a differential power analysis attacks on, yeah, I, on Apple's iPhone's a bootloader encryption. I'm not sure if that's true or not. I guess it's part of the black budget revelation or something. Um, so a while ago it used to be that government would spend billions of dollars shielding everything to Tempest standards. And it's still a big business today. And when we try to create new cryptographic standards, uh, looking at their resistance to side channels is still a major part of the process. So we're definitely concerned about that aspect of them because some algorithms are inherently more secure against uh, these kinds of attacks than others. So there are several different companies that are just devoted to this particular area of research. Probably the most famous of them is cryptography research, which is where differential power analysis was invented. And they hold lots of patents on stuff, and some people have said that's the reason why you're not seeing as many uh, systems use some of these countermeasures because they're always under patents. I'm not sure how true that is. Uh, but you do see these countermeasures used a lot in things like smart cards or banking cards, satellite TV cards, things like that where, where people are concerned about uh, pe people actually using these attacks on them enough that they're actually going to take action. Where you don't see it a whole lot are on consumer devices like your phone. But people are currently looking at exploiting those kinds of, of vulnerabilities on consumer devices with interesting results. So uh, one countermeasure that you do see all over the place are timing attack countermeasures. And that's because they can be done remotely, so they're much more likely to be uh, attacked because you don't have to be right next to them. So if you want to know if your particular device is protected against hardware attacks, uh, you can try testing it yourself, but then you need to be an expert in it, because I certainly wouldn't know how to test it, and I at least knew enough to put this talk together. 
So it takes a lot of expertise to do that. Uh, so you might just hire someone else to do it, but that might cost you too much money. So maybe you decide you're just going to hope your manufacturer knows what they're doing. Uh, but a different approach might be to see if it has certifications. A lot of government agencies and the like require hardware to pass certain tests. Um, and even consumer devices like FCC regulations. They're not really designed for security, but they can at least have some assurance that your thing won't be emitting such a loud signal that you can't watch TV. Uh, the, the FIPS 140-2 is more of a certification against tampering attacks and side channel attacks, but there's other things like your secret classified government Tempest standards that even though we don't know what they say, are responsible in part for that billions of dollars spent on shielding everything. So they might have some interesting things in them. There's also a recent ITU standard called K.84 that deals with Tempest attacks uh, mitigations for the general people. <laughs> it's not classified. So uh, uh, we often think of side channel attacks as a bad thing that we need to just suppress no matter what, but but it turns out they can be put to good use every now and then. There's a company called PP Cyber Security, which was recently in the news because they had a thing where they would monitor, I think, the near field on certain electronic devices like you'd use in utilities. And that would detect an ano whenever an anomaly happened. So it functioned kind of like an antivirus device for embedded systems that wasn't hooked up to the device itself. So if you did have some malware on it, it wouldn't be able to attack your anti-malware process. And the, on their website, they even advertise using this to secure smartphones, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, you can also use side channel-like techniques to verify that software hasn't been tampered with. So check your hardware Trojans. And there's several interesting ideas that are kind of related to this. I just think are fascinating. Like for instance, mind reading. Your brain's just a machine when it comes down to it, so it should be vulnerable to all sorts of side channel attacks as well. That's basically what we call neuroscience today. And maybe someday we'll get good at it and we can like do sci-fi like mind reading. And it makes you wonder, is there any kind of countermeasure for that? Like you see sometimes in movies, people go undergo this weird quasi mystical training thing, hoping that they can defend themselves against the mind reading device. Uh, is anything like that even possible? Uh, I think the research on using that low frequency noise like an acoustic analysis is pretty fascinating because it, we're lo looking at low bandwidth signals instead of high ones like we normally would. That opens up new possibilities. And uh, looking at attacking just ordinary devices instead of things that are specifically designed to be used in high security environments uh, is always fun. So I like to think of myself as a hobbyist about this because I'm certainly no mathematician or anything like that. Uh, but it's a tough hobby to get into, I'll admit that much, because it's you might think that you would need to spend lots of money on it, but it's not really the money, it's the knowledge to pull it off, I think. Uh, so there's cheap tools out there that you can use, like software-defined radios to you do certain Tempest attacks without requiring specialized equipment. And you can, like, there's a bus part I put on there. But what I really am excited about is this thing called the Chip Whisperer Light. It's a, we're advertising it to expect it to retail uh, about $180. And you can do some limited amount of differential power analysis attacks and glitching attacks, which are related to that with this. And there's a Kickstarter going on for it right now if you're interested. So, um, uh, so I'm really interested in getting uh, some resources put together to make this kind of thing accessible to ordinary people like me that don't have happen to have a PhD in mathematics. <laughs> and so I just barely bought this website here. I don't really know what I'm going to do with it yet. But I want to make it into some sort of resource for actually doing s these kinds of hardware attacks for hobbyists. Because right now there's not very many good resources for that. Like there's no like 25 hardware attacks for the evil genius type books out there. That'd be really nice to have though. So 
uh, my goal is to kind of make something like that. And hopefully next year, I can bring some of them to our next version of B-Sides, so you can try looking at some of these for yourself. So, you have any questions? All right, thank you for your attention.